Good morning, and uh, thank you all for having me here today. Um, my topic today is mapping the overlooked, capturing data on less widely recognized species. And I'm going to start off with some big things and then go small. So the big stuff I'm going to talk about is something like this um, robust lance tooth snail that we have in Oregon. Now this guy is a G5 species, so he's not particularly rare, but uh, he's probably the size of a penny, maybe up to a quarter, but really the size of a penny. So as I say, these are the big things I'm beginning to talk about, and these are overlooked. Um, Lucky in this case, I actually have a picture of it. Because if I go to our next slide here, which is the Harney Basin um, Dusky Snail, and looking at the Encyclopedia of Life, I can find I don't even have a picture of the species. So when we have field staff going out to look for these uncommon things, in this case this is a rare species, it is a G1 species, globally rare, um, we find that we have very few tools that really help our staff find and track and monitor these things. So this becomes a big challenge. Um, and in Oregon, the state north of uh, California here, um, the number one group of rare things in our state are snails. So we have, I think, 30 G1 species of snails in Oregon alone. And here we have a list of things here. We're getting into a few pages deep where we're getting some G1 and G2 species using again, the NatureServe Explorer database, which is, of course, a great tool for us. It gives us um, our list of rare things to look for. But again, many, many rare things where we have very little data on these things. So the question is, is something rare because it's overlooked, or is it truly rare? Um, we also have rare caddisflies and mayflies. Those are probably the big three things that are rare in our area. So how do we actually get data on these things? You know, basically we can do the exact same thing, we hope, that um, we can do for the larger things. So example one, site-based surveys. We go out, we get a piece of land, and we can go survey that piece of land. Very typical thing to do. Well, in many cases, we may do something that is more focused than um, just a site-based survey. We may be going to a cave or something like that where, again, um, we expect to find something potentially rare within that cave, and that cave has a very um, small, potentially small area that is much more easily surveyed than a large open area where we may be looking for anything that could be rare in that area. So, you know, for a site-based, you know, hope, you know, we don't have a, a, a checklist of things we need to find in there. We want to know what's there. But we may have a focused search where we're looking for something very, very in particular. Uh, we can do the amplified area search. And for things that are small, it's, uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, these things are overlooked. And we can do windshield surveys. Hey, actually looking at what shows up on someone's windshield on a road drive. Now that's probably uh, not the way that you really want to do something, but you know, in the ocean you can trawl a net and you have a transect. You don't have the point location for that entity, um, but you have that. You know that it occurred somewhere on that transect. Um, instead of the, the windshield example, I was sort of you know obviously uh, sort of joking about that. But netting, so people can actually drive down a highway with a net to collect species on a road transect, or the mass air sampling, where you actually have a air filtering system, and you're pushing lots of air, so large volume of air, through a filter to see what shows up in the filter. And that's good for the very small things that I'll be talking about uh, later. Um, environmental DNA, that becomes a very powerful tool for determining what is in an area. Regardless of something is you know, huge like an elephant, or small, like our snail are even smaller. So that becomes a very powerful tool for looking uh, at the overlooked. Attractants, pheromones, bird calls, bait. Again, very good for big things. May not be quite as good for some of the small things. Um, certainly pheromones work for attracting insects. And we'll talk about that um, in just a couple more slides. Um, bird calls, obviously, we can 
put out calls to try to attract something in. It works well for animals. It works well for things that have mobility, where the mobility is under their own control. Um, chemical signatures, these are things that are odors, chemicals that are given off by an organism, might be similar to um, environmental DNA. Um, odors here, we're looking at, um, say, uh, there's a plant out in the eastern U.S. called sweet pine sap, uh, Monotropsis odorata, at least has an old name for that. And it's um, a saprophyte, it usually comes up under leaves, very easily overlooked. Um, but people know that it's present nearby because they can smell it from tens of feet away. So that becomes a very powerful locating tool for something that would be otherwise easily overlooked. And we have obviously remote sensing to do all sorts of uh, uh, interpretation, either from drone imagery, 3D modeling, um, Landsat modus imagery to help determine where we have uh, appropriate habitat, and likewise, you know, modeling using something maxent, maximum entropy, uh, maximum entropy um, distribution modeling. Um, you know, I have GARP up there, so genetic algorithm for uh, rule set predictability or um, ecological niche uh, factor um, analysis tools that can help us, you know, model where is appropriate habitat to do more informed searches. And I think what's really, really becoming a powerful tool for the overlooked right now is sort of using crowdsourcing um, with community science, getting more people tools in their hands who can then look for what we want to look for. Um, this is really becoming, I think, quite powerful. So this begs another question. Do the techniques for monitoring and mapping the megafauna, these bigger things, do they apply um, to the minute and even microscopic? And we're, in some cases, unsure about this. And so there's a lot of research going on to see if things, you know, if the sets of ranges of certain species, which fall on a, um, a fall, you know, literally on a map where you have some things that have very large range sizes and you have things that have smaller and smaller range sizes, but the, that mathematical extrapolation of that data becomes a linear line, do things like um, very small things stay on that line where they have the same number of large range things and then smaller and smaller and smaller range things? Um, and how rare are these things that are quite small? So I'll move on right now to leave our much more massive, um, robust lance-toothed snail that we saw earlier to something uh, much smaller, in this case, a mosquito. Now, the mosquitoes I'm talking about here aren't particularly rare. But what I want to say is that um, here in this area of South Africa, where we're doing things like, um, you know, I'm not quite sure what disease is present, but uh, certainly um, over in certain areas of Africa, we were going to be concerned about malaria. I'm not quite sure about the area right here. But what I want to mention is the fact that there's a lot of money that's spent on mapping mosquitoes. And so that allows us, because in this case, they're spending money to map disease, really. And that helps ensure that the techniques that we are using to map these mosquitoes, when they say, yes, we can map the location of mosquitoes and predict where they're going to be outbreak areas that haven't occurred yet, that helps us know that the tools we're using can apply to the rare things, too. So that we're looking for some rare insects, a rare mayfly or something like that, and we have some information about where it is that our techniques that we use to predict where it might occur are valid because it's been proven elsewhere. And in fact, we can look at other areas. This is uh, in Switzerland, looking at um, basically habitat analysis for, again, mosquitoes because there's money in disease. And we find that there are areas where there are predicted to be very high levels of mosquitoes versus areas with low levels of mosquitoes. So the techniques um, become validated. So if I look at this map here, which is a bunch of rare endemic aphids that are in Nepal and Bhutan, we can take what were point locations and then make predictive maps from this using GIS to determine where we have suitable habitat to do more inventory or to work on protecting those uh, endemic uh, rare aphid species. 
if we so care. And of course, care is an important thing here because we need to think about that. So, also in Oregon, where I live, we have something like this guy right here, which is Texasporium sancti jacobii, which is a rare lichen. This is a crestose lichen. It looks like a couple of cigarette butts right there on the ground. And I mentioned on the ground. You have to be on your hands and knees to see this guy. So inventory for this becomes challenging. It is small. It is non-mobile. You know, unless we have better predictive maps, it is more by chance that we find this thing. Um, so it becomes very difficult unless we have better tools to try to find something like this. Now, in contrast, I may have this area like right here, Falling Springs, Virginia, is uh, an area I worked on uh, many years ago, and this became a unique habitat. So this became a focused study where we have a waterfall splash zone um, just beyond a hot spring or warm spring, and we have this calcium carbonate rich water that creates a increasing rich line of calcium carbonate which then accretes outwards and then finally comes down, uh, but we created a unique habitat for uh, a splash zone and became then therefore a targeted uh, site for inventory. We did a moss survey here um, to find um, rare mosses. We, used, we figured that how many hot springs do you have right next to a waterfall? Um, it is something that was quite unusual in Virginia when I was working there. So it became a focus target for, in this case, mosses. Now, here we have the outline of Portugal, and we have another research group looking at mosses. This is, um, in this case, uh, Rachometrium hesperium, and an uncommon moss in Portugal. They have their EO data right here for the species. So these are herbarium records, or records from herbaria. And they went through a series of mathematical habitat modeling, or species distribution modeling techniques uh, with Maxent, Gart, and uh, ENFA to predict where you might survey for this moss or where habitat was beneficial. And their analysis indicated that you know, the Maxent was by far the better tool now, I felt they fell short in the sense that they actually could have overlaid all three maps together and found out where the zone of the intersection of all three would probably give us uh, an even better idea of where we have the most favorable habitat. So this actually had the highest um, um, values for that there. So yes, we can apply these tools to things like mosses. We've gone from snails and vertebrates to insects um, to lichens and mosses. Um, how small can we go? Well, we can go smaller. So, at this point, we're down looking at blue-green algae. So we're looking at cyanobacteria now. And what we find is that there are a series of point locations where they were surveyed for a particular type of blue-green algae and found that, yes, indeed, we have a gradient of this blue-green algae against a uh, salinity gradient. And so, you know, the question is, is that, yes, these small things still behave like they're larger things. Things respond to chemical gradients, and we would have expected that. Um, so that's the question. Do spatial ecological principles of microbes match those of larger species? And what studies have shown at the University of Oregon and other places that there is a lot of similarity to those things that are quite small, bacteria, the archaea, there is a whole broad um, array of microbes that are in different phyla and kingdoms nowadays. Um, so yes, that becomes our good starting point. Uh, but again, do we care about the really, really small? And that's something that we'll get to in just a minute here. So uh, more work has shown that we have within the atmosphere, we know that we have bacteria that are in the ground and that are in water. Um, but now, is the, back, is the atmosphere also a viable ecosystem for, say, certain living creatures, in this case, bacteria? And we can say definitively that, yes, we have bacteria that move, that live, that gain energy and reproduce 
in the atmosphere. Um, therefore, that really indicates that that atmosphere is an ecosystem for bacteria, and we can even make predictive maps of where those bacteria will be in higher densities, and we'll find that some areas of the um, far north of Russia and up in Canada become very dense areas um, for bacterial in the atmosphere. And uh, so data may be missing from these areas here, but we have predictive maps of where these things are. So again, why would I care? Well, how about this? If we think that, I mean, do we have it on here? Yes, we'll get to it in just a minute. So, go to our next slide. Um, in some cases, we can map, easily map habitats where we're going to find rare bacteria. And so we have a map here of Michigan, and we have a series of fens. And we already know these fens are basically um, very distinct ecosystems that support many, many rare species already. And of course, they're also going to be supporting rare bacteria, as it turns out. So, um, further along the way, we have certain databases that we can use to look at to see where we have rare bacteria. So this is Backdive, and um, we're actually looking at a very identifiable bacterium, or maybe I should say archaea. It's a thermophile, so this make sure I don't get myself um, pummeled by my uh, microbe friends. Um, we'll call this an archaea. And uh, Chloroflexus aronticus. So this is a bright orange thermophilic microbe. And in this database, the spatial resolution of this database says, yes, it's in the United States. And this is the best database we have for the point location of Chloroflexus. It's in the US. Now, we can do much better than that. Um, but the question that we have up there really comes to, you know, again, do we care? Well, a paper recently came out by Alusi and Lennon, and it indicates that from their research, there is likely to be one trillion, TR, one trillion microbe species here on Earth. You know, our body pretty much has uh, about 100 trillion um, bacterial particles on us. So if we have 100 trillion bacterial particles on us, it's not really surprising to know that there could be a trillion species of microbes in the world. Now, just one out of 1,000 of those microbes is rare. In these cases, if we have rare organisms, there may be rare bacteria in those rare organisms. But again, if we have one out of 1,000 bacteria that are rare, that is still one billion rare bacteria. So this does become something that we based on that number, that we do want to pay attention to, to understand biodiversity and understand rareness. Now, we may not spend money to do the same sort of um, conservation work for this, because if we preserve the very large, we're probably also at the same time preserving the very small, too. But it does tell us that there are things to think about. And of course, what I want to say is that these things are fairly identifiable at times. We have these bright orange maps right here, kind of hard to see in this photograph of the lighting here. But, um, you know, I can look at this and go, that is chloroflexus. So doing survey work doesn't require me to have a little petri dish to culture this thing. And someone who has um, maybe very little experience working with bacteria can still walk around and survey some hotspots and say, yeah, I see bright orange floating mats of stuff which is probably very indicative of the fact that it's probably chloroflexus, uh, aronticus in this case. And certainly in this area here of Yellowstone, we can see that there are bright yellow, yellow orange rings there. Now I also have up here where it says New Zealand and Iceland, because again, do we care about rareness? Um, we can definitively say that there is a bacteria or microbe, make sure I get my terminology right, got a microbe, a thermophilic archaea microbe that is in a hot spring in New Zealand, and that is the only place where this microbe has been found. Even though there have been teams that have searched many, many hot springs around the world, they have only found this particular species in New Zealand. Now, a second species that has been found in New Zealand and in Iceland. 
So 17,000 kilometers apart, two known locations for a thermophilic microbe, only two locations known in the world, even though many, many other hot springs have been looked at. So we do know that we have rare, rare things. Now, that said, using things like eDNA and looking at a series of hot springs, we can find that we also have, as would be expected, we have some weedy things too. So we have a weedy thermophilic species that are out there. So in the series of eight hot springs that were investigated, we have this guy right here shows up in all eight of those hot springs. And so we have, this becomes our kind of our weedy guy who's there everywhere, always present in all these hot springs. But you'll notice over here on the right hand side, we have some other hot springs that have much, much higher diversity of microbes. And so we have some areas where just one or two microbes dominate. Other areas here we have equal domination of basically um, 20 different phyla of microbes. It's not just species, the phyla of microbes. So much higher diversity. It would be really inter interesting to understand why we have some that have low diversity and some that have high diversity, just as an, an hot springs, as something that becomes a focus survey area. And so we can do some principal component analysis of these things and find out that things like pH and temperature, as might be expected for a hot spring, become big driving forces for what is present there. And uh, so certainly temperature was indicative, the pH mean have been as indicative, and might be that driving force for why we have that diversity there. Now, just going beyond hot springs, we can look at hot soils. These are some things that we've probably most people don't think about. If you have hot springs, likely you have other areas with hot soils, and they became, they become their own, or they are their own habitat for rare things. And so we have a transect along here. That, this is work not done by me, but by the people in Norris at all. And they set up this transect to look at what was along that gradient, and they did their temperature profile. They found, yes, there are areas that were up here about 65 degrees centigrade, down to just above 30 degrees centigrade. So the cool spot was over basically you know, human body temperature up to um, 65 degrees centigrade. And analysis shows that they have um, a complete set of different species that live in different areas as you go from hot to cool. So we have habitat, rare habitat, for things that are uncommon. And only in the hottest soils are you going to find these guys, and then in the cooler soils you're going to find these guys. Now, if I use tools like, you know, iNaturalist, which would be great to get people involved in these things so that we have more people searching for some of these things that might be easily identified. Again, think about chloroflex, this is big orange mat of stuff. It would be great if we could get, you know, other people involved to help us survey it. There is no place currently in iNaturalist for microbes. So I don't quite have a place where I can do that. I got protozoans, I guess. Um, so that might be the, the best bet for that. Um, but, you know, bacteria don't quite have a spot for it. But again, you know, iNaturalist becomes this very powerful tool because, you know, my big interest, you might say, is, is, is lichens. And, um, you know, here we have a silmar right now. And I have some point locations that someone else who was involved in studying a lichen called Nibla, fog lichen, has um, been tracking the location for different fog lichens. So I'm like, well, geez, it'd be great to see fog lichen. And lo and behold, I come out around the corner here, didn't quite make it to there, but stopped right here and come up with another record of fog lichen. So right here, this is our fog lichen, photographed yesterday um, out here at a Silomar. So these things, um, Getting people involved can really, really help with your surveys to collect data on the overlooked. People become fanatical about these things. Uh, also, I can see in Oregon, you know, when we have a, a bunch of resources that get put out, you know, the rare graphites of Oregon, the rare lichens of Oregon, dragonflies of Oregon, we have books on, you know, a lot. Maybe, many people don't care or think, um, you know, every, every green thing that looks like a grass is a grass. Uh, we have the Sedges of Oregon, Snails of Oregon, Pacific Northwest, and just maybe more general 
you know, books on these. These things um, are great tools and, um, you know, allow us as researchers and the public to begin to understand, recognize small things better, collect data on it, and finally, um, you know, oh, so we have a, a, you know, a colleague who is in Central Oregon who hasn't been trained in biology at all, yet has now, because of a rare book on lichens, and has become a fanatic, has now found uh, a whole bunch of new state records uh, for lichens that we didn't know existed in Oregon before. So it's great to have someone like that who is a retired person who's now just out there because that's what he wants to do, collecting data that we can then use um, to make better prediction records of things that are rare. And here we have, I'm finally getting close to the land here, a series of transects looking for um, a rare skipper. Oh, what's cool is we can use new tools now, um, like trained dogs. We have pigs that will smell truffles. There are dogs trained to smell truffles. Well, Cody Burkhart and um, Richard Bren, um, uh, Buskirk have a dog trained to pick up the smell of a larval butterfly that's rare in Oregon. It's a golden spot, uh, silver spot butterfly. It's a golden but silver spot butterfly. And we can see that the, the dog's loose. This is the host plant, a violet, and we can find the dog hoons in on places where we're going to have um, that scent that the dog's trying to find. So in conclusion, tracking in all species that are rare really helps us understand biodiversity overall. So we don't want to ignore the bacteria, because we know there are rare bacteria out there. And with a better understanding of um, biodiversity, we're probably better poised to implement better conservation methods when we fully understand why things are rare, things like that. Um, and we're continually improving our tools for spatial mapping, um, which showed you how we can use dogs that have GPS transmitters on them to collect data. Um, you're getting citizens involved collecting data because you have them eyes all over the state or all over your survey area collecting data. And of course, if you then um, protect the big, you're likely also protecting the small too. So you have a, a rare pangolin, that pangolin probably has rare bacteria associated with it. So, you know, when preserving one rare pangolin might preserve, um, you know, 200, 300, 1,000 rare bacteria for all we know. That is unknown. Um, many, many sources there looked for this. I'd like to acknowledge SGIS. And of course, um, Lori Loki, uh, who funds my position at the University of Oregon. And thank you.